and welcome everyone to This is Recruiting, a series focused on helping tech recruiters and HR professionals around the world to find actionable insights and tips from fellow recruiters on taking tech recruiting to the next level. I hope all of you are staying safe and taking care of yourself during these unprecedented times. I'm Sachin Gupta, the founder of Hacker Earth and your host for today's session. Uh, at Hacker Earth, our vision is to match developers to the right opportunities all across the globe through accurate coding assessments, remote interviews, and virtual hackathons. And this is our video interview series where we talk with various experts in, in you know, kind of driving that mission forward. For today, we have with us Christian Blood, who drives people operations for North America at Zoho Corporation. After having spent years in the academic world, Christian moved over to the corporate world with Zoho and has been doing some interesting work there. Welcome, Christian. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me today. It's a pleasure having you. So uh, can we begin by you telling me a little bit about yourself and what's your role at Zoho? Of course. Uh, so as you said, I come from an academic background. I have a PhD in comparative literature and classics. And before Zoho, I was on the tenure track and I taught mainly Greco-Roman literature and writing to undergrads. Uh, I have no problem admitting it. I didn't want to write my tenure book. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who aren't familiar, if you are lucky enough to land a tenure track position at university, you need to write a book uh, in order to advance from assistant to associate professor. And uh, tenure books are hard to write. <laughs> Unsurprising, right. they don't just hand out tenure at universities. And I took an honest look at my personality and the type of person I was and you know, to write a tenure book for academia, you have to be incredibly focused and willing to spend thousands and thousands of hours uh, alone. And I found that I loved teaching and I enjoyed talking about information, but I didn't, I didn't think I had the right personality to spend that much time by myself researching. And I thought, well, there are very few uh, tenure track positions available and there are many PhDs deserving of the opportunity. So I decided to pass the opportunity on to someone else uh, and I resigned my position. And I ended up uh, in HR for Zoho Corporation. I think they're not unrelated. My experience has been that uh, the type of people who enjoy teaching and who enjoy sitting with undergraduates and talking with them about their writing and their academic plans uh, tend to do well in HR. I joke with my friends that HR for a tech company is not different than office hours with a professor. So and, and what's the commonality? I, uh, a really sustained interest in the individual. So, you know, HR sometimes gets a bad rap because part of HR's mission is of course to protect the employer or the company. And that's one component of it. But I think good HR is a mechanism for advocacy for the individual employee. And that's something I really enjoy about the job. Whether you're recruiting, you're looking at a bank of applicants, each of whom has something special and compelling to offer the organization. But you know, you have the organization might have two openings and a hundred applicants. It's a difficult process to figure out which of those applicants you want to extend an offer to. And then once a company recruits someone, it's about working with that employee and nurturing them over the years as they advance from an entry-level position up through the ranks. And a lot of it is about the, uh, of course, the absolute capabilities or talents of the individual employee or the individual student following the university example. But so much of it is about fit and finding a situation in which you can bring out the best in an employee. So in a way, it's not unlike figuring out which high school senior should, should attend which college, which university would be the best fit for someone. And then, um, you know, you can, you can continue the parallel and say, well, what team should an employee work on? They're talented and they would add value to a lot of different units of the organization. That's not unlike an undergraduate selecting their major. They might have a lot of interest, but they need to find the place where they can really blossom. So uh, a really uh, sustained and compelling 
interest in the individual and their success is, I think, what makes university teaching or teaching in general and uh, HR work similar. That's a very interesting parallel, uh, Christian, and uh, I kind of agree with what you said. Uh, it's, it's really about caring about that particular individual and helping them identify their strengths and weaknesses and then you know do the fit in in the overall scheme so you know that that kind of uh, takes us you know very well uh, segues into our topic for today uh, which is mm-hmm. early talent hiring and i know you know zoho uh, like so many other organizations may not be actively hiring right now because of the whole pandemic mm-hmm. but uh, i'm sure you must have looked at it this looked at it over the years and and you may you would be rethinking about how to go back to hiring once once you know that mm-hmm. resumes are already resumed so let's start with the first question you know how does soho go about its early talent hiring what's the philosophy uh, and what are the uh, you know thoughts and uh, strategies that you have put in place for early recruiting yeah well i think we need to back up a little bit in order for me to lay some groundwork that will make my answer uh, more legible to you uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Zoho's story, I want to give a little background about the company. Zoho is a privately held SaaS uh, software as a service provider. We offer close to 50 individual apps or computer programs is a way to think about it that allow small, medium and large businesses to run more smoothly. Our flagship product is a CRM, but name a business function, and we have a solution for it. Zoho has been around in one form or another since 1996. Uh, Many people are surprised because we have a very low profile and we're a very modest company. We don't have a lot of hype and we don't do a lot of PR. So unless you uh, have been looking for a CRM, you probably have not heard of Zoho. And in a way, that's how we like it. But to be around since 1996, In the tech space, we're really dinosaurs. Very few companies have been around that long. Moreover, we've been been profitable the entire time. Uh, And you know, the tech unicorns like Uber and DoorDash are still trying to figure out how to turn a profit. But the most important thing about us is that we are entirely self-funded. Zoho has never accepted outside funding or VC money at all. We're bootstrapped through and through. Those things are important because we have developed since 1996 a really robust company culture that allows us to develop our own best practices and our own way of doing things. And because we don't have to answer to investors or analysts, we have the freedom to pursue projects or experiments in the way that we think is best. And we never have to capitulate to what outsiders want us to do for the sake of efficiency. What this has come to mean in practice is that we have, I think, tremendous latitude and freedom when it comes to our recruiting. In some ways, I think of Zoho as being a self-selective employer. And what that means is uh, we, in many ways, wait for people to come to us or we find people who are interested in what Zoho has to offer and what Zoho is all about. Oh, I should make one uh, one clarification. I'm speaking on behalf of US uh, Zoho's United States operations. That's where I work. We are fundamentally an India company. Our world headquarters is in Chennai, India. We have several offices throughout India. And in India, we have uh, close to 9,000 employees. There, things work a little bit differently. But for the U.S. side of things, uh, we're very small and we are very, uh, we know ourselves. That's how I would say it. Uh, You know, the the edict from Plato is to know thyself. And at Zoho, we know what we are and we know what we want to do. And we're able to proceed without input or distraction from investors or analysts. What this means in practice is that we hire a lot of people who do not have a background in the position for which we are hiring them. I'll use myself as an example. As I said, I uh, have a background in academia and I, my actual uh, expertise as per my education is second century North African Roman prose fiction and its reception in the 18th century English Gothic novel. So that was my dissertation topic. Um, 
And when I was done with that, a friend of mine worked at Zoho and uh, she was managing a team and she needed someone to work in content review. And so I joined the team. And I remember sitting down and talking with the president of the company for my interview. And looking back, <laughs> I'm almost embarrassed. Looking back, I had no idea what I was doing. Here I was, I just resigned a tenure track position. I wasn't sure what I was gonna do with my life. And I'm having an interview with the company president and he wants to talk about CRM. I, at the time, did not know what CRM was. I had never heard of it and I had certainly never used it. And I thought, oh my gosh, I thought I bombed this. I just have to be very embarrassed and get my car and drive away with my head, head, head hanging low. Turns out that they didn't really care about that. They instead thought that I was intelligent, thought that I could express myself clearly and thought that I was uh, sort of of the right constitution and disposition to do well at this company. So a lot of what we look for when we do uh, bring people on board is whether or not, well, we look for hunger and we look for passion, but we also look for people who understand what we're trying to do. A very basic way of, or a way to put this in really tangible terms is to think about the issue of compensation. We have uh, one of our offices is in Pleasanton, California. Pleasanton is in the Bay Area. And so it's in, it's just down the street from Amazon, from Google, from Airbnb, which is going public this quarter, they think. Um, yep. You know, that's what's in the air. The air in that area is all these stories of uh, these unicorns that have enormous market valuations but have never turned a profit. And you know, for people who are young and looking for jobs, they hear stories about uh, enormous signing bonuses and the uh, huge amounts of money someone can make on paper if they're lucky enough to be in the first 50 or first 100 of a company. And part of my job there is to say, you know, uh, if you if you want to buy a Tesla and you want Amazon or Google or VC money, that's fantastic. I respect that. That's not what we're about. Rather, what Zoho is about is an organization with very very little very little pressure in terms of meeting analyst or shareholder uh, targets and. Um, we offer a lot of stability and sanity. Now, now I, 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 for someone who's at the right point in their career, that's an easy sell. But for someone who's very young and very hungry and goes into it assuming that they're going to get a new position and start at 150K, that can sometimes be a tough sell when I'm the person who brings that sort of bad news. Uh, and that's, in a way, what I mean by uh, self-selecting. You know. Another place that I see this a lot, and I've always been skeptical, are the types of amenities that employers will use to attract new uh, talent. And we sometimes see these stories about uh, new companies that have a juice bar or on-site massages or bring your pets to work or a ball pit, something like that. And I say those things right. are great and they sound like a lot of fun. We don't get involved with that. We for one, are spending our own money. So if you're burning money on a ball pit or a juice bar or car detailing for employees, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to burn uh, someone's VC funding, but instead we're spending our own money. So we try to be very judicious, but instead we offer a compelling product at a valuable price or a good value for consumers. And we've been around since 1996 and I anticipate we'll be here in 2026. So a lot less hype, a lot less of a roller coaster, but something honest and value uh, of value to an employee. And you know, I find that a lot of people do like that. Not everyone does. And so Zoho would not be for them. Got it. So really uh, like the point about, you know, being self-selected, uh, selective, uh, and that makes so much sense because each organization is different. Uh, and even if you look at individuals, every individual has different needs at different stages of their mm -hmm. life, and they need to make sure they need to decide what organization matches up to their expectations and ambitions and then make that mm -hmm. informed decision. But you also brought up an interesting point that 
you don't necessarily hire people who have say an academic degree in that mm-hmm. field or or necessarily past experience and your your example is point in case so then does that put a lot of um, uh responsibility on you to ensure that people are upskilled uh, the right way as soon as they join the organization what's your take on that and how does that happen yeah. you know as an organization zoho is skeptical of higher education and its degrees and i know i have a phd uh so it might not make a lot of sense with that coming from me we have 9000 employees worldwide and three of them have phd's me the woman who hired me and then the founder and owner shreeder vembu uh no one else does here's a story many many years ago in india zoho when it was starting out kept hiring people with expensive mbas and one of the things we found is that people who came to us with an expensive mba knew a lot of business theory and management theory but they didn't necessarily know the things we needed them to know we still had to train them uh quite extensively in order for them to be ready to contribute to the organization and we thought that's kind of a crying shame someone has gone out and spent a ton of money um in india the situation is slightly different but uh we've learned from this and practice it in the US many people in the united states go into enormous amounts of debt in order to get a degree and a degree makes sense if that's what you want but we did not find that an expensive degree made an employee any more or less successful and so what we do is we pay very little attention to degrees when uh we read resumes and when we try to recruit people if someone has a fancy expensive degree we certainly don't hold that against them uh right but we 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 recognize that it's not the, the secret sauce is not in the credentials and we're going to have to spend a lot of time onboarding and training someone to be successful for us so we thought why not look to the large swaths of the population who don't have the sorts of privileges and access to get them the degrees so uh you know in california when we do searches there they're open to everyone but i'll admit i pay very little attention to the candidates who have degrees from Stanford and UC Berkeley because i figure if someone is graduating from Berkeley or Stanford uh they're going to be fine <laughs> you know they they've already won the lottery in the united states and so we look right. to other schools here in austin uh i pay very little attention to the candidates who come out of ut austin and i look more at the community college system or uh other universities that are excellent but don't have quite the brand power of UT Austin. So I figure we're going to be spending 3 to 6 months onboarding someone. We might as well uh not further enhance the lives of people who come to us with a lot of privilege. And we take this very we take this very seriously. Um you know in, in India we are now making a uh, a real concerted push to hire outside of major cities. Um Shreeder Vembu for any listeners who are interested in Zoho, do a Google search for Shreeder Vembu, our CEO and founder. He's been talking a lot about what he labels as transnational localism. It's the idea that you can be a globally relevant powerful company but avoid the pitfalls of trendy and expensive hot spots. And you know this is the kind of thing you see in the news right now with everyone working from home from the pandemic, do you need to live in San Francisco and pay San Francisco prices? Right. Long ago, Soho said, "Eh, we don't need to. We're not trying to impress anybody. Somebody who must live in San Francisco or Manhattan in order to actualize the kind of life they want probably would not be happy with the uh mm-hmm. modest and humble sort of day-to-day life that comes with working at Zoho. So we are now looking further and further afield from uh traditional centers. When Zoho established itself in India, uh it was in Chennai. At the time 20 years ago, Chennai was mainly known as a declining industrial center, sort of a rust belt. It was mainly manufacturing. People thought Zoho was crazy. they said you need to be going to mumbai or one of the uh hipper hotter areas and we said no we we have faith that 
we will go to an unsexy, unpretentious area and we'll be able to recruit compelling talent there. And that turned out to be true. But in the intervening years, Chennai has become another hotspot for the tech scene. Uh, yeah. It becomes trendy. A lot of people move in. It becomes increasingly more expensive to live there. And we find that a lot of our employees can't uh, get a good place to live and raise families comfortably. So we've started expanding in Tenkasi. I don't know how well you know the geography of Tamil Nadu. Tenkasi is a tiny town at the very southern end of the peninsula. It is, uh, I think from Chennai to Tenkasi is a 12 hour overnight train ride, something like that. Uh, we're actually, we're not in Tenkasi, we're in a village outside of Tenkasi that no one has ever heard of and, uh, or no one in the U.S. certainly has never heard of. And we've opened, uh, we've opened there and people who want can transfer from Chennai down to Tenkasi and we've started hiring from those areas. This was all pre-pandemic. Since the pandemic, we've thought this makes, this is the way to go. And so now we are opening in India, uh, I think 10 to 15 small offices and small villages. Each of these offices will have to start 10 to 15 employees. And we're, we're looking for storefronts and houses. I mean, we have a 45 acre campus outside of Chennai with 9,000 people, but it seems that maybe the days of the 9,000 corporate campus are gone, or at least they're on hold with the pandemic. It's more of a liability. So we're opening these small little places and it allows us to uh, make Zoho available to more and more people who would normally not have the opportunity to apply for a job. So that's what's going on in India. Right now we're looking at how we can do the same thing in the United States. So. Zoho originally was located in Pleasanton, California. That's in the San Francisco Bay Area. For those of you who know, it is devastatingly expensive. And yep. uh, what we found is we could not hire people at entry-level positions and pay them so that they could afford housing. And we're not the only company that's found that. So 12 years ago, we opened an office in Austin, Texas. 12 years ago, Austin, Texas was known as the state capital and it had a vibrant music scene, but it was still a small city and it was nothing like it is now. Uh, this was before South by Southwest and Austin city limits took off. This yeah. was before, uh, now Tesla's just announced it's building a factory. There's talk of Salesforce, uh, Apple's building a campus and we find that Austin is becoming precisely what we were trying to avoid. Uh, real estate prices uh, in terms of purchasing a house or paying rent on an apartment have skyrocketed over the last five years. And we're again being priced out of the market. So what we've done is we've started looking at smaller towns in Texas that might be a good place to set up these small little regional hubs. Uh, we're not ready to announce publicly, but soon we will be announcing where we're looking in Austin, where, where we're looking in Texas. And the idea is to find a town that's ignored, find a town that can't compete with the branding and hype of Austin, where there's still uh, qualified employees who certainly want a solid job so that they can be self-sufficient, start a family. And we hope to be making inroads into these areas that have that tend to be overshadowed and forgotten by how exciting some people see Austin as. So that is very interesting, Christian, uh, as, a, as a strategy and very uh, unconventional. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, it would, given the whole pandemic and, and the way it's changing the world, I think this thought process is going to play to your advantage because mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if I look at it, then Zoho was already is was already thinking was already acting on being distributed, uh, being mm -hmm. you know in, in maybe even remote areas, and and the reasons mm -hmm. that drove you to do that were different. But now with the whole pandemic, uh, that placed your advantage because you could go to these less expensive places while ensure mm -hmm. that you know the organization is set up to work 
remotely with people distributed all across the country and the world. So yeah. that's super interesting. Uh, so next question yeah. is, you know, what's your take on like, how does Zoho look at diversity while recruiting mm-hmm. early talent? This is a tough one. And it's one of the things that I take most seriously in my role uh, working with HR at Zoho. Uh, most obviously, one of the advantages that our program allows or our approach to hiring is by not paying a lot of attention to Ivy League or fancy degrees, not requiring uh, a high pedigree of previous work experience. We are able to you know, do something genuine about class diversity. Now, this is something that I think is not often talked about in the Bay Area. You can find Bay Area companies that do have uh, what is apparently a uh, significant racial diversity of its employees. But, you know, it, I, I think it's important. Absolutely. I think it's important, but maybe you're missing something if you do have uh, a, a, a good racial diversity of your workforce, but everyone does come out of a Bay, excuse me, an Ivy League school, or, you know, if everyone comes from the Bay Area. So one of our first goals is to withdraw ourselves from that elite system of credentialism and top schools and only hiring graduates from these programs and go after folks from community colleges or junior colleges or no college at all. Uh, We have a lot of opportunities for people who have associate's degrees or only have a high school diploma. We have found that for the right person, we are able to offer something and folks who come to us without a four-year degree are still able to give tremendous value to the organization and find a real home with us. My basic way of looking at it is that if you undo the constraints of, uh, for lack of a better word, economic and educational privilege, you will find that greater diversity follows from that. You know, the majority of Americans are not rich. And the majority of Americans uh, don't have access to elite four-year institutions. So if you no longer look at the four-year institutions, you are going to find many, many, many more options in terms of your hiring. Zoho is lucky. Zoho has done very well in terms of uh, other axes of diversity and our hiring. And I want to keep doing that. I want to make sure that uh, we are able to bring people into the organization who want the sort of uh, stability that we are able to offer. And I think that many people are. You know, there's, within racial diversity, I spend a lot of time worrying about age. Um, If you're a tech company, it's very easy to skew young if you are not careful. You know, if you're hiring a support team, if you're not conscientious, you can end up with an entire team made up of people under the age of 25. Now, that's great. You want to you want to give these opportunities to people who are uh, in their 20s, but you want to make sure that you're not leaving out veterans or people who had to take time off because they were raising children and all of those sorts of things. So that's one of the things I've been looking at. One of the things, Zoho has always been very flexible with uh, how often someone needs to be in the office. And we've only become more flexible with that since the pandemic. You know, uh, a a minor segue, we knew what was coming with the pandemic uh, because we have offices around the world. Zoho has offices in mainland China, Japan, and Singapore. And so we started talking about coronavirus and what to do about it in January, early January. And I'll tell you, I live in Austin, Texas. No one in Texas was thinking about the, yeah, no one in Texas had heard of coronavirus. And if they had, there was no notion that it would be affecting life here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, At Zoho, we paid very close attention to what was happening in Japan and China and Singapore. Those offices closed very early on. I think our our China office is not far from Wuhan. And so I think they closed in January and we said, okay, well, this will probably be here sooner rather than later. And so 
In early February, Zoho went on high alert and we started working on our work from home contingency plans. Uh, those were done by the end of February. And so we just waited until management made the call. And I believe it was March 3rd, 2020, I got the announcement that all Zoho offices worldwide that were still open were going to close and all employees were going to start working from home effective immediately. And so I was in the office when that happened. I told a few people in the next room, you should go home. <laughs> you can go home now or you can go home this afternoon, get what you need. We allow people to come into the office, but pretty much overnight, our worldwide workforce of more than 9,000 people started working from home. And we were lucky, it was pretty seamless. Uh, of course, it should be for us, it'd be a problem if it wasn't seamless for us because we do make cloud-based uh, software. Right. The biggest problem we had was uh, people making sure that they had the right chair at home. So some people would come into the office, pick up their chair and bring it home. And you know, we had a lot of lost extension cords and that sort of thing, but we did it almost overnight. And that has shown us that any sort of preconception we had about the importance of an office, it needed to be challenged. And we needed to deeply think about what, you know, what the importance of the office is. Now, it's been on September 3rd, it'll be six months that I've been working from home. That's a long time. We've had a lot of time to think about it. And we've decided that we uh, still believe in an office as a space for people to come together. And we really believe in the happy serendipity of spontaneous conversations that can happen. People talk about the water cooler. We finally happen more at the coffee maker. But people from other teams getting together and talking about their lives and then about their work and the sort of opportunities that grow up around that. We hope those do not completely disappear. You know, with online remote work, siloing becomes very simple, uh, or yep. excuse me, siloing becomes prevalent because of course you're not going to have a spontaneous chat conversation with that person from another team you've met before, or it's a lot less likely. Yep. Uh, that's the part we're rethinking. But what we've also found is that we have much more freedom than we thought possible. This means that we can hire people in areas that are traditionally far from an office if we don't have to worry about commute times or relocation costs. This means that we can hire someone who might be taking care of young children or might be taking care of uh, elderly relatives, their parents, for instance. There are a lot of people who we think could contribute tremendously to our organization who had not been looking for work because uh, they were taking care of children or parents. And I'm very excited to see where we can go with that. Also That's in okay. Texas, there's a, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. And when you look into it, there's also the veteran population. There are thousands and thousands of uh, men and women who have uh, given years serving their country. And when they enter the workforce, they're often at a disadvantage because uh, the years that most people spend, uh, the, that the traditional employee would have spent cutting their teeth in entry level positions, these folks are deployed. Uh, and now oh, we've always had a preference for hiring vets. Uh, it's something that I think is incredibly important. And you know the, the barriers to entry, I think, are much lower now. There, uh, can I talk about the things that make me that that worry me? Yeah, and I think the challenges absolutely. that come up. You know, one thing is that anytime you want to recruit based on what I've been calling self selective, uh, let's look at it another way. Zoho has tremendously gotten a large number of its employees uh, by referral or word of mouth. We have many couples who work at Zoho. Um, we have many people who send their friends or family members to apply at Zoho. On the one hand, that's great. And we think that if an existing employee thinks highly enough of us that they would like their spouse, cousin, child, parent, aunt, uncle, or friend to work with us, that's a, a huge vote of confidence. And we take that as the compliment it is. The downside is if you are not careful, hiring people based on referrals means that you hire the same sort of people you already have. Uh, yeah. yeah, 
it, back to academic analogies, uh, it's very unlikely for a PhD holder to get a tenure track position from the institution that gave them their PhD because you end up reproducing your strengths and your weaknesses. We're keenly aware of that. Our hope is that now that we are looking at more geographic diversity, we will be able to find people who uh, don't already know us. You know, if you're, if you're intentionally not hiring in the town where you're set up, you're going to have fewer people who already have a personal connection with the company. Right. Uh, the other, uh, not an anxiety, but uh, something I'm thinking a lot about these days is the role of the interview. Um, we have relied tremendously on interviews because we don't pay a lot of attention to your credentials. We don't care too much where your diploma is from. Um, you know, to that end, when I read resumes, it's nice to see if someone's applying for a support position or pre-sales position, if they have prior support or pre-sales experience. But you know what I look for is retail and food service. If somebody has spent their time in college or when they're young working in a restaurant or running a cash register or even doing stocking, that tells me so much about that person's, uh, I think, potential to flourish much more than what their degree is from. Uh, but we have to kind of to, to, to figure out how our system of not paying attention to credentials can work well. We've relied tremendously on the interview. Now that doesn't mean that a person needs to come in and wow us. We have conducted many interviews where I suspect that the candidate feels that they didn't do well, that, you know, we've all had job, we've all had job interviews that don't feel like they go well when we're interviewing. We feel like we didn't say the brilliant thing. We stuttered too much, we talked too much, we talked too little, et cetera. You know, again, we don't really pay attention to that. Uh, uh, chemistry is nice, but we're not only hiring charmers, we're hiring people who can do a job and can do it well. And so there have been plenty of opportunities where candidate, plenty of instances where a candidate has felt that the interview didn't go well and we've surprised them by making an offer because we like the way they think, we like the way they carry themselves and all of that. But again, one of the things uh, I worry about or I try to be attentive to is that you don't want the interview to take too much, uh, to be too central because you don't want to just hire people who you feel uh, instant chemistry with. There are plenty right. of compelling and fantastic employees who, you know, you don't fall in love with in the first 30 seconds. And uh, a lot of the data I read suggest that a lot of employers or interviewers, whether or not they admit it, make a decision in the first 30 seconds during an interview. Yep. Yep. And I think that's something we have to resist at all times. And, you know, to that end, when we do our interviews, I like to have a real conversation with someone. Some tech companies are famous for devising these incredibly complicated questions, sort of the gotcha. Uh, Google, I know, is famous for doing these. And it probably works for Google. They have their own uh, their own mission, but I'm not fond of any of those. I don't like gotcha moments in interviews. I don't like these incredibly uh, ingenious puzzles and riddles because very rarely in an employee's workday at Zoho are they presented with an ingenious puzzle or riddle that they need right. to figure out. I look if someone's nice to talk with and if they seem to be open-minded and hungry. And, and I think, that, that hunger is what really does it. So as HR, the sorts of things that I think about as we move into a new era of recruitment is how important is the interview? Will there be situations where we do need to preserve an in-person interview? Now, I, you know, the way things are working in Texas, if for some reason I had to do an in-person interview next week, uh, you know, I would send the person a questionnaire about their temperature, their COVID <laughs> symptoms, their travel history, whether they've been with someone who's been exposed. And then I would invite them into the office. We would not shake hands. We would stand far apart from one another. We'd be wearing masks and we conduct the interview sitting at opposite ends of a giant table in a huge room. I don't know if that's a good, I, 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 I am, I'm thinking a lot about what 
what what I would learn during that situation and how much how helpful that would be to seeing a person's uh, potential and hunger and ability contribute to uh, ability to contribute to the organization. So I don't know. The other thing, you know, uh, I came into the pandemic with a tremendous skepticism toward Zoom and things done online. Yeah. And my mind has been thoroughly changed. I have found that you can accomplish so much, yeah. uh, basically with what we're doing right now, that honestly, I didn't think was possible. So I've been proved wrong with that. That's interesting. So uh, a couple of things, you know, that I, I, I picked from what you said was, uh, if one tries to tackle class diversity, you automatically end up tackling other kind of diversities as well. Uh, you know, the recruiting world is permanently changed because of this pandemic. Uh, a lot of things can be done on video. Uh, you, you talked about hiring for the right uh, attitudes as well as the right mm -hmm. Uh, competencies that people, you know, exhibit, not, I would term it as potential and not just necessarily mm -hmm. what school they've gone to, what diplomas they have. Uh, so, you know, kind of, uh, kind of combining all of that together, we're almost coming towards the end of the interview. Uh, mm -hmm. There are, you know, typically in early talent recruitment, there are, we talked about hiring for potential, we talked about, and there is always this element of scale. And you talked about, you know, going to so many different places. So how do you see these two things kind of panning out? How, how do you ensure that you are still able to hire for potential because there is no face-to-face -face conversation uh, and you're also able to tackle a much larger scale because now one can hire from anywhere in the world, right? You don't need to be confined mm -hmm. to the Bay Area, which though has never been, but I'm assuming even your pool is now becoming wider. So how do you tackle for mm -hmm. scale and how do you continue hiring for potential given the <laughs> pandemic and how we've changed? I'll, I'll tell you the way we're doing it is we're starting slowly and we're going to be cautious and judicious and intentional before we do anything large scale. Um, you know, I anticipate that when we do decide to start hiring in the United States, and I don't know when that will be, uh, you know, the <laughs> there's a lot that's not up to us that we have to see how things shake out. Boy. I do hope we get a vaccine next week. Um, I think if we if we if we don't get a vaccine next week, and we are thinking about uh, recruiting that is primarily online rather than in person, and if we're trying to look in places that um, are further afield from the tech and cultural centers where many companies are setting up shop, we'll be doing it slowly. And this is the way Zoho does everything. Um, we've recently, over the past three years, have gone from nothing to a 50-person workforce in Mexico. And a lot of that we did slowly, and we did uh, with phone calls and Zoom interviews. And we learned, um, we learned, you know, the issue isn't whether a Zoom interview is good or bad. It's just a different sort of thing. And so you have to have a slightly different uh frame of reference and horizon of expectations when you go into them. The US team will need to get up to speed for how to handle more remote hiring and how to go through the process when less of it is in person. So I think we will probably do what Zoho always does, which is you start small. Start with three people and we'll see what we learn from recruiting our first three people under this model. And we will, uh, you know, see what went well, see what we need to work on, and you just keep at it. And next thing you know, we might have 50 to 200 people who were brought in this way. And what we find is that because we answer to no one but ourselves, we don't have, uh, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to go through the motions and do something that we think looks good to someone. We know what's working and what isn't. We uh, have to answer to ourselves if something is working for us. And so by doing it slowly and judiciously, uh, I think we become quite competent in things. You know, In India, before the pandemic, they would have hiring fairs where, you know, we'll, if you're interested in being a software developer, we'll put an ad up and say, anyone who's interested in being a software developer, come in next Saturday and take a test. We would sometimes get you know, 
over a thousand people who would show up for one of these tests. Now, I think this is great because again, we're not only hiring people who come out of the top universities, saying anyone is welcome to come and take this test. But you know, we didn't start out doing that. We did not start out hosting a test for over a thousand people on a Saturday. We started with something much more modest and uh, figured out you know, the ins and outs of the new approach. And I'm always glad that at Zoho, we don't participate in a lot of the, I call them hype metrics. We don't, anything that's too hyped and you know, we just don't bother with if it doesn't make sense to us. Another example would be uh, Zoholics. Zoholics is our annual user event. And when we first did Zoholics, we did it ourselves and we probably had 200 people come and attend it. Uh, the 2020 Zoholics was canceled because of the pandemic, but the 2019 Zoholics had several thousand people and we had rented out an entire convention center and we didn't have enough space. And that was over a period of five years. We went from a very modest thing with maybe 150 customers where basically one employee drove to the bagel place and got bagels for everyone to this enormously complicated event with thousands of people and the mayor of Austin speaking to our guests. And we were able to do that successfully because the first year we didn't, we didn't try to entertain 4,000 people. We started small and worked up to it. That makes so much sense. Uh, uh, you know, Christian, I've thoroughly enjoyed having this discussion. You know, uh, I think we've covered some really interesting topics. Uh, and yes. uh, I am fascinated by the philosophy that Zoho has. Uh, and, you know, there are so many ways to build a successful business. Uh, and, you know, like to your point, it's not necessary that one has to run after the hype. Uh, and, and Zoho is, I think, mm -hmm. a, a great example of doing that. So that that's all the time we have today. And it brings us to the end of the episode. Yes. This is, it was really nice talking to you, Christian. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, so I'm sure, uh, you know, I, I have enjoyed speaking with you uh, and I personally learned a lot. I also believe that uh, all those who, folks who will be listening to this video will enjoy listening to you. And, and if you do, please share this video to spread the word and remember to share your opinions and learnings on the comments. Uh, lastly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you're notified the next time we have a new episode. Thank you. Uh, see you soon and uh, stay safe.